The left seems to assume that their ideas will become successful by the virtue that they benefit the 99%. The famous saying from Canadian media theorist Marshall McLuhan that the medium is the message is more relevant than it has ever been. And the ideology that captivates the most people wins. Socialist thought is arguably not as popular as it could be because most people don't even bother to learn about it in the first place. They just hear narratives and then go with it and don't end up checking it out. But thanks to people like Bernie Sanders who popularized the term socialism, people are actually taking the time to actually look up the history of it and what it actually means and the historical complexities behind it. But using overly complex words that only make sense within niche leftist theory echo chambers is not going to bring any new people to leftism. It will just intimidate people and give a product for people who are already in that echo chamber to consume. It is absolutely crucial that the left must avoid being confined to insular echo chambers because many good leftist memes and leftist contents didn't become as successful as they could have been because they never left the left. Even though many of the popular Trump memes originated in the subreddit r slash the Donald, they did not stay in r slash the Donald. They spread elsewhere, dispersed everywhere, and found their way into mainstream discourse. This is what the left should be seeking to do with their content, is spread their content and ideas outside of already existing leftist circles. If you are not trying to reach new audiences and introduce more new people to ideas, you are not educating new people. You are just giving people a product to consume. But to have ideas spread beyond leftist circles, the left must produce content with the conditions of our virtual platformized world in mind. Fractal leftism with cool stimulating content that seduces people's attention away from the banality of everyday life and capitalism and counters the narratives of capitalist ideology is very important to the movement. To an armchair academic or an old school out of touch Marxist, this might just sound like a load of crap. But the idea that cultural production can transform politics was already argued by thinkers like Herbert Marcuse and Theodore Adorno who particularly believed that in an irrational society, radical art and the irrational joy and creative desire that it brings to people was one of the few but desperate ways in which to wake people up from the irrationalities of capitalism. The old world is ending. And we have the opportunity to rethink everything. This is a show about the systemic problems in our world. And the real solutions we have today to transition from an apocalyptic storm of war, scarcity, and ecological collapse. To create an abundantly advanced, collaborative society. That sustains all life. You may think it's an impossible dream. But the alternative is an inevitable nightmare. We're your hosts, Matt Holton, Amanda Smith, and Zachary Marlowe. And together, we can move past this economic absurdity and come together to actualize our collective potential to create something completely new. We are Mindless Society. All right, so, Tony, you were a hard man to uh, get into the, the box, to get into the battle station. We've been uh, going back and forth, planning a collab for months now, and we've had... Uh, a, a couple of like little quick discussions that ended up turning into like epic two hour long discussions. So uh, just a brief little introduction of who you are. Uh, you are t one, one dime, one dime radio podcast and one dime, the YouTube channel. One of my favorite channels, uh, one that uh, I first saw your video on the deficit myth. And I was like, who's the fuck is this guy? This video is excellent. And uh, proceeded to watch a lot of your videos and with envy, I'm, I'm envious of your ability to make, pithy, short, YouTube-friendly, stylish, fun, dynamic, and information-jammed uh, videos about the state of what this thing that we call capitalism is and what comes next. And uh, so ultimately, that's kind of what we always kind of talk about is this space of like critiquing the existing system, it, 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 you know, using different lenses to analyze it, but ultimately to push forward into something new. And that's what I really like about your videos and about, you know, you as a person is that, um, you're not really stuck in the past. You do employ lenses of analysis like Marxism that uh, are tethered to old movements, but I feel like you have a very contemporary grasp 
on the moment, on the technological possibilities, on the failings of old systems. And uh, that's, I think, a good place to, um, to talk about. Basically, I would like to get into what I, where I always want to go, not retreading old territory and movements hundreds of, hundreds of years ago, but talking about what a new post-capitalist movement would look like, the new left, the future of the left, the present of the left, or going beyond the left, because I think it's an arbitrary term to begin with. So um, that's not really a good opening for you, but why don't you just introduce yourself first? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, yeah, as you said in the excellent intro, and very flattered by it, certainly. Very envious of your setup right now. That's uh, that's a hard... I want to replicate a really good setup so I can start actually recording on camera um, like this more often. But uh, yeah, I make uh, video essays and mini documentaries and podcasts. I've been fairly inactive uh, like this past year due to a variety of professional obligations. Uh, but uh, I certainly seek to uh, get back into it. I uh, know uh, there's a lot of things I've written, like as like essays, academic papers, which I plan to kind of make into more accessible video scripts. So there's all sort of interesting stuff I have in mind. And uh, yeah, um, Marlo, I was, we uh, vibe very well, like when we first uh, encountered. I think uh, probably, I'd, probably because I would say in addition to being super ADD personalities and very curious <laughs> types. Uh, <laughs> the uh, other factor I think is, I would say like what we're both sort of doing is more broadly on what I would call like the non-dogmatic left, um, which is what I see myself kind of doing. Uh, and, and there's certainly other people I'd put into that category too, but not many. Um, because yeah, like, uh, you know, you might identify broadly as like a libertarian socialist, but you're not stuck into like a specific label and a specific ideology necessarily. Like you're, you're very clearly interested in uh, like, how do we actually go beyond into a different society? And that, these are the questions I think we need to think very seriously about. Uh, it's not something I really claim to have the answers either to, um, but uh, something I am exploring. And in order to uh, really position a, a better society we need to also kind of re-examine the history of the left too because uh yeah like you said i'm not uh really like stuck in the past but i think we need to historicize in terms of what went wrong to not replicate certain mistakes and to um kind of learn from those past mistakes and then create a better vision based on that and based on conditions of existing society so i think yeah like a lot of people want a grand uh, i'll say one one last thing right there is uh, I came into this starting YouTube with the idea uh, that I was going to like a sort of almost like a counter propagandist, like trying to make uh, anti-capitalist uh, like videos that would so-called radicalize people to uh, not be uh, like on the right to liberal centrist, maybe even like social Democrat. And they'll go to a, um, a more post-capitalist frame of mind. But as I got more, as I started reading more really and like learning more, it got to a point where I just really, there's no real left that I felt, number one, seriously existed, at least in North America, uh, or, or that was coherent in any way. And a lot of the alternatives that existed, like that you can see on YouTube today, like, um, you know, in, in real life, but you, since we're on recording podcasts, like we can, the represent, sometimes over represented on the internet, like let's say Marxist Leninists, uh, maybe uh, different types of anarchists. Uh, Whatever, like I didn't, I didn't feel like any of these groups. Are, they all had certain flaws, and uh, more and more, I think what my project actually is is it's not just kind of trying to bring people to post capitalism, but it's also, uh, in many ways, trying to. They're also targeted at lefties too, like in a, in a, to be very critical, um, because I think we need to be more self critical. We need to ask more questions. We need to. Ask, go back to the roots because it's easy to say, oh, well, let's just all unify against the system. But if we don't settle certain differences, settle what we're, what we want, what are, what is the good that we're striving for, the good life, right? You know, as uh, ancient Greek philosophers would say, is well, we don't, we, we can ally ourselves with people who have very fundamentally different like, goals. And that can be sometimes dangerous. So, um, yeah, that's more or less what I'm doing. Sorry to give a long-winded answer, but uh, yeah. Well, long, long-winded long answers are literally the, the purpose of a podcast. My formula for a good pod, podcast is find someone who won't shut the hell up and give them a mic. But yeah, I, I think uh, that's that's precisely where we really 
um, connect it first is in being this kind of, um, I don't want to say like, like non-discriminate or, or sorry, like non-denominational, non-dogmatic, uh, multi-dimensional uh, perspectives on anti-capitalism or going beyond capitalism. I mean, even mm-hmm. saying anti-capitalism positions you in like this reactionary thing where you're just against the old thing and you're going to reflect in what you're trying to create as an alternative based on the arbitrary conditions of that thing. And so uh, I think what we really need is to really move forward and really step outside in so many ways of so many people that when you when you go, go on the internet and you say, I'm against capitalism, you're going to find a certain group of people, or you're going to mm-hmm. find groups of certain kinds of people saying these things, you know, critiquing the system, many of them with very relevant critiques, many of them with very dogmatic, uh, <laughs> rabid, insane, religious zealotry that, you know, they're trying to apply these crazy, uh, you know, belief systems that were perhaps relevant a hundred years ago. And then there's other schools of thought saying, fuck you, your shit's not, you know, at the time they were saying, this is not good. This is not going to work. This is going to yield horrible results. And, you know, we have uh, a very large cross section of experiments of leftist experiments of different kinds of leftisms of different kinds of socialism of different attempts at what communism could be. And I think these are really, you know, interesting. And I think there's a lot of good stories there and there's a lot to learn about what works and what doesn't work. But we are in a fundamentally different set of circumstances, different set of material conditions than have ever been experienced on the face of the earth. We have different problems. And I think the biggest of those is our ecological crisis. And I shudder to define myself in any kind of leftist terms because that's kind of where I come from is from the perspective of environment, of environmentalism, of ecology, of basically looking at the structural problems uh, that are driving the mass die-offs in in nature, the warming of our planet, the destruction of life in all areas of of the web that hold it together. And that's really where I'm coming from in trying to construct what is a new system. And I think if we follow the demands of, of what our planet is putting us into, you know, don't centralize, you know, your uh, food system in this, you know, really destructive way. Don't over uh, strip the land of its resources. You know, don't create a consumption based economy that uh, requires more and more and more, you know, taking from nature all the time for arbitrary purposes of money. Don't do these things, you know, create something that is resilient, create something that actually uh, is based in the ecology. And then I think the second, um, piece of that, of, of, of basing our idea of what a new system could be like is in the technological capacities that we have today that are just fundamentally different from any other period in history that changed the, the game in terms of any conversation about labor, of you know, what it takes to create value, of you know, what is possible, of how we can make decisions when we're in the age of AI and automation. And um, that's, you, you did some really great videos on automation. So I think that's, that's like, that's something that's just really weirdly missing from a lot of people's perspectives on creating new systems is using the tools we have at our disposal. Yeah, certainly. Um, I think I would agree with the position that climate change is like the primary contradiction that we're faced with. It's actually bef- more important than uh, being against capitalism, even though they're deeply connected, obviously. Uh, but for example, like the as you're mentioning, like uh, anti-capitalism encompasses a lot of different tendencies, sometimes not very well-formed tendencies, it's sometimes just an anti-position. Um, and yeah, I mean, we need to um, think that anti-capitalism in itself doesn't really lead to a politics. Like a, a politics is something that can actually lead to a change in the existing power structures that keep the existing system going. Uh, and to build a fundamental politics is, is very difficult. Um, it includes wrestling with all sort of contradictions. Um, and with uh, anti-capitalism, sometimes I think now especially, you have, I think, broadly, a large sector of the population is anti-capitalist to a certain extent already. Um, it's just that many of people have, they have very different ideas to what that really means. And I think there's a very watered down version of anti-capitalism. Uh, you have on Netflix, this whole industry I've, I've been seeing, like capitalist anti-capitalism where they have like these subtle little anti-capitalist critiques, but like it's just there to almost, oh, it's almost there to like, uh, like uh, have a check mark. It's like, it's like almost the way anti-racism has been turned into like this sort of token gesture. Uh, I feel like I could see capitalism, anti-capitalism turning into that. I don't know if you've seen the series called You on Netflix. 
Um, no, a lot, a lot of a lot of women love it, um, but it's a uh, pen badgley or whatever. But like anyway, they have this like anti capitalism in there, but it's like very superficial and very it's just like anti rich people, basically anti bourgeois, more or less rather than anti capitalist with uh, regard those like, yeah, so we need to wonder, look at we need a system that's actually better in capitalism. It's not just anything that isn't capitalism is good. Or that, uh, and, and also we have to acknowledge just the reality that there'll be a transition in, in any system. It'll have birthmarks of the old society. Like whatever society comes next will have birthmarks of the old society. Um, so it's going to be a kind of process to overcome like the social relations. We have certainly, I think, the productive forces, uh, as you were sort of alluding to with like the tools we have. We have a lot of the technology capable of like, making a, a post-scarcity society um, possible, arguably, arguably. Um, but what is harder is changing the social relations. And that's something no real socialist project actually really succeeded in doing, which is ultimately like there's capitalist social relations that can continue in a socialist system. We saw that with like a lot of like the Soviet Union uh, and most actually existing socialist states. They had very like capitalistic social relations, even if they're, production wasn't capitalist per se. Um, well, they still had a society so, based on, on money and markets. That too, but also just like, you know, bosses, employees, kind of like these same sort of like hierarchical structure. Hierarchy. Really. I'm not totally against hierarchy, by the way. Like I'm sort of realist on this regard, but like, I do think like, yeah, it is a, it is like a, it's a position of domination. So like hierarchy doesn't necessarily involve domination. Might be well, I think there's some, a... some people might find that controversial, but like these type of hierarchies, I think we're both like, we'd both be against would be like these hierarchies that involve like a like kind of domination over the class that's supposed to be uh, emancipated, right? The working class, and uh, the I don't like the word working class. I like the word oppressed masses or dominated classes, just because there's a lot of people who are, aren't really working class, like lump and proletariat, or like women who just like you know do housework like are they working class or what or just you know there's all sort of demographics of people who are like dominated classes who aren't uh but yeah yeah i'm a, I'm, a, I'm a homeless mentally ill uh unemployed unemployable uh <laughs> lump and proletariat i'm not exactly working class <laughs> but i'm definitely i've always been marginalized by this even just from the standard standards right. of like neuro neurotypicality yeah, I wanted to pick up on something you're saying there that about the anti-capitalism being like a hashtag thing, and it's like you were po you were tweeting about it the other day. You were like basically fuck Twitter, this is useless, and I feel I like really uh, I smashed the like of that one because I feel that so intensely that so much of the left and so much of anti-capitalism is online. It's relegated to these online echo chambers that are actually diverting people's attention and energy away from building real things and actually from even thinking about, you know, real visionary, you know, uh, conceptualities, because we're just in this, this perma reactive argumentative sort of mode where we're clicking, clicking, clicking. And we feel like our outrage and our public outrage is itself an act of rebellion, an act of activism. And really we're just consuming. We're, we're putting things, something out there that, you know, we are also consuming and we can't consume our way out of this. So yeah, I mean, there's, it's such a, there's so much we could talk about. I mean, the, the two of us, we, we could probably talk for 10 hours straight on all of this I will, stuff. I will put a warning though, is, uh, so there is like this online sort of interpassivity, uh, where people live their revolutionary, they experience like revolutionary desires vicariously through consumption. That's certainly a thing. Uh, however, we shouldn't get, uh, fall into the trap of what I'll call like actionism or movementism which is a tendency because there's a lot capitalism or I wouldn't say capitalism, just like in the in society, there's just a, a multitude of what I'll call false alternatives in terms of there's and capitalism will be okay with tolerating those alternatives. There's all sort of like fringe little like outdated, like communist parties that will, you know, suck the uh, people's youth out of them and their money. <laughs> uh, in order to just reproduce their own little sex. And I mean, like, is someone really sects? <laughs> I don't know. But uh, it sounds... It, someone might think they're doing something by joining, like, a fringe Trotskyist organization or, like, a fringe, like, Maoist organization. But at the end of the day, I mean, 
a party, like the idea of building a party Fuck, is really only useful if you have like a mass in the first place that is remotely at least cultivatable or mobilizable. And I think we're not at that point yet. We need to really actually lay the foundation, get the ideas out there um, so that when there's conditions um, that are, you, one could say, uh, lead to a revolution or whatever, like uh, the, the material conditions are so immiserating that it pushes a lot of people to revolt. And that won't necessarily lead to anything good. It, I, I do want to say that the more time I spend online, especially in these spaces, these like ideological echo chambers, I feel like I'm interacting with like a dark crystal that like I'm able to make connections with people like you that I fucking love that like, you know, we, you know, are, are true friends that I have the majority of like my best friends are people that I've met through social media at this point. And, uh, mm. but it's like this, it's like spending time in this pulsating darkness that like warps your DNA. It's like being in fucking Chernobyl or something. Like it gives you the power to reach across the world and yeah. like make these social connections. But it's uh, it's it rots your brain and it, it gets people thinking in um, I think I think you had a point you wanted to get into but I do want to say this that your channel is called one dime because it's about one dimensional thought it's about going beyond one dimensional thought and I think that's uh, really a powerful idea that we are stuck in one dimensional thought we think that to be anti-capitalist is means one thing that you're automatically like people, it's, it's duality. You know, you say you're anti-capitalist, someone says, oh, you must be for socialism and government control of everything. And this is, blah, blah, blah. you know, it, instead of having a, an open fluid discourse where we say, okay, we're against this existing system and we're for something else, which could be anything. It could be any number of things. Yeah. I'd say um, broadly one dimensional thought uh, in the way I understand it, I, re I refer to it as thoughts that cannot grapple with contradiction. So it, it, uh, it uh, deliberately almost precludes contradiction. So, you know, when you have these, when we talk about uh, certain movements, there's a lot of things that are both true and false in a lot of narratives. Like, for example, uh, there, there'll be two things that, two things that are seem radically opposed can be both true and both false. That's what I mean by, di it's a dialectical way of thinking. Dialectics is not like, this uh, antithesis, synthesis, uh, thesis, and they come together. No, no, it's actually this. There's never really a synthesis. There's contradictions that are kind of almost irreconcilable, but they just can coexist. So a good example of that way of thinking is like, okay, if we look at the USSR, some people are compelled to either just write it off entirely, say it was some kind of like all a totalitarian evil capitalist project or whatever, nothing to learn from it other than it was bad. Um, and then there's the other thing where some people will acknowledge its successes, but then go to another sort of extreme where they feel like they have to defend everything about it and that everything that happened that might have been like unfortunate was for a reason, apparently. Uh, and that's sort of like the very, yeah, that's one dimensional thought. Um, so, yeah, like you said, I'm very against that. And Twitter, pretty, pretty, and, and, pretty revisionist and take, Tony. Pretty, pretty revisionist take. Got to say, <laughs> as a party member, as a member of the party, the one true party, I fly the red flag. Pretty revisionist take. I think I'm going to have to have you the party for that. line. The party line. <laughs> you got to follow the party line. Yeah, we were in the club snorting party lines the other night, uh, all night long. <laughs> yeah, we seized the means of, of uh, reproduction, blah, blah, blah. blah. Yeah. Um, I think that's production. that's really the essence of um, of what we're trying to do is to change the way people think, not just not just uh, going from one bad thing to another thing. You know, we want to change all of it, and I think that uh, a lot of Marxist theory is about how material conditions and structure creates the behaviors and the ideas and attitudes that we have. And I've been thinking a lot lately about this line that the uh, Zapatistas. Um, say where they walk with questions. They have all these, these, these little sayings and things that basically allude to this understanding that they are recreating their society, that they have done a revolution and changed the means of production. They have changed their social relationships and they are going somewhere that is going to change them. And they don't really understand fully where they're going. And I think there's, there's really great wisdom in that, that even to think that we are going to change our relationships to production or that we're understanding the ways that technology is changing our minds already and that the ways that uh, our material structures in society, you know, change us. 
and that, you know, you can take the intention of a good person, say, you know, and put them into a bad structure. And that's going to basically iron them into the shape of the structure. So I think that's a really powerful idea that is lacking in a lot of people talking about dialectics and material conditions and all these things that don't really understand the sociological truth that structure is, is a greater dictator of behavior than someone's intentions. Uh, that last part is uh, the essence of Marxism, actually, as how it's supposed to be interpreted. Um, although people s focus too much on the identities of agents in the system as opposed to the structures that reproduce such agents. People are more so actors that fulfill roles that the system creates and reproduces. And people reproduce those roles. Like, um, I mean, this is the way, this is... This is where I think Marxism is pretty useful um, in, in this respect. Like, for example, you're not going to really change things per se by just like replacing the bourgeois politicians with someone from like a pro background. Because if you don't change the structures that are reproducing social relations and the, um, I mean, reproduction of capitalism as a whole, it's just going to perpetuate itself, really. Uh, that I, I had a video about that a while ago called well, Why Billionaires Prefer Democrats, which is just a clickbait title to really explain something far more complicated, which is that. Um, I also have a video I'm going to make at some point called um, Why the Ruling Class Need Not Rule. Uh, and it's about okay. about that. But like, I don't want to get too far into that uh, void. I, I also don't want to steer you too too much off course as to what you want to talk about because these are very broad questions that are hard to s simply like you know encapsulate well, well you know the point the point with you tony is to to get lost in a discussion that takes us wherever it wants to go you know because the uh the questions sure. are big and and it's personally fun for me to explore them that's why you know we we do this when we talk and and i enjoy it because you know you have a for lack of a better word, like a, a psychedelic understanding of these ideas and that you're able to sort of take your brain out and put it into other ways of thinking and changing the way that you perceive information and the lens of analysis that you use. And I think that makes you an interesting thinker. It makes you an interesting person to talk to because I do. I feel the same way, that I'm not just in one belief system. I'm able to take my brain out or float outside of my body and look at myself and my own you know, reactions and the ways that I'm interpreting information and how I'm in, you know, seeing it and what I'm putting it toward, but ultimately synthesizing something new, you know, something emergent, something that can't be squeezed into one box. I mean, and that's, that's like, uh, that's kind of like something that doing a lot of psychedelics, as we were talking about before we started, will open you up to that, you know, your everything you think of can be, is it's just a, can. just an identity. And not, nece and mo not necessarily will, but it can, it can. Everything you think of can I, I just want to leave this like to the listener that like everything you think of is as perfect factual crystal and truth could be a lie, could just be a story and you could believe it. And I think that's the real power in understanding the way that structure impacts our brains and the way that money impacts and relates in, in the way that understanding how these social structures and these positions of power change us. And we can tell ourselves, no, no, I'm, I'm totally right. I'm totally justified. Um, I do, I do actually definitely want to get a little further into uh, the beyond, the post-capitalism, the designing new systems. But I, you've been studying um, the Soviet Union and uh, China recently. Um, and I'm really interested to get your take on those, quote, actually existing socialisms without making that a whole long thing, if, if you can just basically give your perspective on those. Because I see so many of those one-dimensional takes where it's like, you know, the Soviet Union is all good, China was all good, or they're all bad, or, you know, and I just think uh, there's there's definitely something to learn there. Oh there's boy, tons to that's learn there, a, of course. <laughs> that's a really big question. Now, if, I will say one thing before I answer that, just because um, I want to say this before, but I forgot. But with regard to anti-capitalism, um, sometimes when I don't have, like, I don't, I'm not prepared with like a answer per se. I will refer people to people who are like way smarter than me, uh, who I've been reading, uh, who, who have definitely helped me understand things a little bit better on, along the way. Um, there's, um, there's a writer called er Eric Olin Wright. So he's a Marxist sociologist, I believe. Um, yeah, he has a book called How to Be an Anti-Capitalist in the 21st Century. And despite the sort of like 
cheeky title. It's actually very, very in depth, and it goes over various alternatives. It's very nuanced. It goes over things that have been tried. Uh, I would highly suggest that. Um, and with ecology, I mean, there's all sort of stuff. There's like a new book called Half Earth Socialism uh, that I've heard good things about, um, which is very much centered on the ecological side of things. Uh, Climate Leviathan, which is not so much about the designing new society, but about like different trajectories where you could go into. Um, so yeah, like I like ultimately there's, there's different, there's different um, sectors of the population who are going to have like different roles, different interests. I figure people who are nerdy enough to listen to people like us are going to be curious types. So that's why I'll <laughs> refer to like books. So like, you know, cause I like, there's the learners, right? Not everyone's a learner. You were mentioning how, you know, you're like open-minded and like we're open-minded and stuff and psychedelics can make people open-minded. I mean, it can. Um, but I think I will say like most people are just fundamentally afraid of chaos and the chaos of reality is very hard to deal with. People adopt, people adopt one dimensional thinking and ideology and grand narratives and religion, not merely because they're just inculcated into it. It's not just, they're not indo merely indoctrinated. They choose it often because it's a way to escape the abyss. And a lot of a lot of people can't handle that, and we have to just. That's why I think it's a contradiction I've been wrestling with. You, for a politics to work on a mass scale, you kind of almost need those grand narratives. But if you want to understand what our politics is going to be, you know, which I'll I'll say is more like the people who are more active politically. So broadly, people who are, you know, doing uh, activism. Maybe they're uh, learning about things. They're doing videos or in a party or whatever, like some kind of like po there's some politically active in some regard, like probably listener base largely here would be like act more politically active than like the average person uh, in terms of consciousness. And uh, those people are learners. So I'll refer to them, but I always want to like remember that we have to accept that like uh, for politics, there is going to be like a sort of grand narratives and like ideology but I don't think we're at the stage, like I said at the start of this, um, that there's really a politics that exists that is really worth doing propaganda for. Because uh, I think there's so much like confusion. The left is, we have to remember, the left is very, uh, at least in North America, only just revitalizing itself. Because you can't really say like the Democratic Party is left. Like I would say the furthest thing on a mainstream scale that America has got to the left, for example, is like Bernie Sanders, which is center left, you know, at best, center left at best. So in like that is kind of his loss is kind of, uh, I would say, radicalized a lot of people who were uh, and, and Occupy Wall Street, various different events have pushed people to explore alternatives. Because before you couldn't even be, say, you're anti-capitalist, you couldn't even say the word capitalism. So what you're saying is that we're lacking in a grand narrative and that we're in a fractured state of disarray and, and reconstitution of this thing that was the left. And I, I, I really relate to the way that you've said that there is no substantive left to grab onto right now. There's nothing really that that is sweeping through the world that is like we can jump onto and grab onto as if it's this moving mm -hmm. train. It's something that is reforming itself. And I think it's important for us to not merely reproduce old forms and structures and old slogans and religions and dogmas and visions of what that could be, but to truly create something new. And I feel like there, the, you know, there is a popularity and an ease of like marketing and pitching things like socialism and communism and anarchism and all these hashtags that, you know, if you declare yourself, you're going to find other people like you, but I still don't really feel like those movements have a hold on anything real. I don't think that they're building something that is uh, worthy of saying, I'm going to sub, I'm going to sell out essentially my view of how I see myself as a revolutionary as, as someone trying to create something new and grasp onto these movements and then try to steer them towards something new, which is like, I've been in a lot of activist groups. I've been in a lot of subgroups and all kinds of cliques and parties and, and um, you know, little social movements. And it just seems like this disarray of retreading old, old territory is negative. It's, it's keeping us from actually connecting to the broad need. You said earlier that most people are anti-capitalist in the ways that they that they hate sitting in traffic. They hate their boss. They hate, you know, not having health care. They hate that everything costs money and that it's getting more expensive all the time. Maybe they can't piece all those things together and understand that that's capitalism, but um, they feel it. And I think that there's a, there's a vast well of um, fuel 
to tap into in the agitation and the hurt of the peoples and in connecting all these issues together. And to do that, we need a grand narrative. Yeah, but this is the difficulty, right? <laughs> is what, how, do, how do we figure out what the grand narrative is? Because this is where I think like, we still need to figure out what our politics is based on. Because before, like, yeah, I, I, that's what I'm saying. Like, we would need a grand narrative to mobilize. Um, and this is why I've kind of been really uh, sort of as of late heavily looking heavily at least studying the role of re the religion uh, in um, socialist movements and just political movements in general. Uh, but yeah, no, we need a grand narrative, but like right now, I mean, the thing is I, I would be skeptical of a lot of like grand narratives that aren't well thought out because we still need to figure out what a politics is based on. Like, I think to me, the success of Marxism Leninism in spreading so much uh, in the past few years, I mean, maybe superficially, but it's certainly like if the spread's pretty undeniable, um, like it's, it, at least if you consider to like where it was before. And I think their, their success is the fact that they have a grand narrative. But the thing is, is there, I think their grand narrative is um, many ways actually like can lead to detrimental politics that will reproduce the old systems. Uh, not entirely, but well, it's like, a this is why we need to still figure things out. Right. So there's, this is the contradiction. We need a grand like narrative, a, but we also need to, figure things, the multiplicity, the complexity of things, which is not grand narratives. It's not one dimensional. So I guess that's sort of what we're doing in these conversations, obviously, like grand narratives don't involve complex answers. They involve like short answers. Um, and that's interest. That's like useful politically, but I think we need to get to a point first where there's like a left worth fighting in, at least that's how I feel about it, because there's all these false alternatives, as I've said before. Yeah, so um, to bring those two things together, Marxism and, and religion, I mean, I think about the early Catholic Church and um, the ways that they basically reduced the complexity of the message of that, that uh, you know, religion into a few things that they could use to spread it easily. Like Jesus died for your sins, John 3.16, all that shit. You eat the wafer, you drink the blood, you're saved. You know, they, they reduced it to something packageable and sellable like a corporation to spread it to as many people as possible, as fast as possible. And I think the Marxist Leninist narrative that, Oh, we just kill them. It, it's spreading because it's very, it's simple. It's a simple message. We just kill them. Then I mean, they the don't say guys. that like, and I think that to be fair, to be fair, just cause I, I have a lot of viewers who are ML. So like I, they obviously, I know when you say that, you don't mean that literally, but like, you know, figure it like essentially, like, yeah, they do have a kind of like that. I'd say that's more the Stalinist mentality, which is the the people who are parasites to the project just need to like somehow go. Um, I mean, that's never worked <laughs> ever. <laughs> like okay, real, real buddy, quick, without making story. that uh, to, to get back into that a little bit about um, if you can, I know it's difficult because especially you've been studying it so intensely, but like talking about the ways, can you, What's your perspective in a simple way of how that hasn't worked in the Soviet Union and in China? I mean, no, they're, very, they're both different. Well, but. I mean, well, in the sense that it hasn't worked because they're not around anymore. I mean, one of the China turned into is now like the best capitalist power we've ever <laughs> seen. Uh, like it's certainly I would say China is a progressive country, but it's certainly not a like communist, like socialist, at least now. Like if there's a. Uh, could it transition to some sort of socialism in the future? Like maybe, maybe. I just don't think it's a really. I think they are actually just not a Marxist socialism. Not a. It's a socialism with classes. It's just uh, you know in the sense that like um, Saddam Hussein was also a socialist. Many people adopt socialism as a label. It doesn't like it encapsulates very different things. Um, but I mean, yeah. One, the Soviet Union is not around. China is you know doing the exact opposite of what Mao. Uh, was striving for so clearly something failed but um you have a lot of grand narratives as to why these failed and i think um a lot of them are wrong like you have the trotskyist one that's very popular in the west which is you know the bad guy uh stalin he got power instead of the good guy trotsky even though stalin ended up uh, implementing a lot of trotsky's policies that he advocated for 10 years earlier like forced collectivization uh which is you know something trotsky supported in the 20s, when people thought it was nuts, and Stalin ended up actually implementing it, which was one of the most, you know, as we know, very destructive policies, you know, that completely like bred this like absolute hatred of the, from the, of the peasantry towards communism for very reason, like good reason, you know. So 
you know, there's there's that, uh, but the, the and then there's the ML anti revisionist narrative that you'll hear uh, a lot, which is that um, Khrushchev, Nikita Khrushchev came to power and he's in a sort of coup, and um, after Stalin died and revised and and set on a path towards uh, away from class struggle, away from uh, so communism more broadly. And denounced Stalin, and uh, you know, I'm. It's it's very difficult to speak of these things, but that's more or less the narrative. And that that like shit shit went bad when Stalin died. Okay, that's more or less her narrative. And that Stalin needed to purge more of the revisionists, which uh, Stalin really thought he was doing. By the way, that's what makes the system all more. I, I've terrifying. seen a lot of people. I've seen a lot of people say the the only thing Stalin did wrong was not kill enough people. Yeah, which to me is just incredibly you know, insane to believe. Funhouse ideology, like that, yeah. just warping someone's brain into accepting uh, a narrative. Hey, friends, we'll return to the main conversation in just a moment. But we're taking this quick break to ask, do you want to do something about all the issues we talk about here on our show? Do you want to learn more, get involved, and help us help others break out of the cycle? Step one is to join the growing community of rebels and kind hearts sharing their knowledge and passion. Follow Moneyless Society on our social media pages and spread the message to people who need it. When you're ready, you can get involved by reaching out and becoming a Moneyless Society volunteer. We need every skill imaginable, large or small, if we're going to resist the powers destroying our planet. And even if you don't have time to volunteer, you can help us build the dream with donations of any size. We create all of this community and content because it is our passion, but we need resources to get it done. Monthly Patreon donors receive cool perks like early access to future episodes, and visitors to our website, moneylesssociety.com, can buy MOSO shirts and other merchandise that help spread awareness. We're glad you're here, and we hope that you'll keep learning and growing with us. The goal may seem far away, but we can get there together. But uh, I, I think that the basic idea is that if you really study the history of the Soviet Union and of China and of these actually existing social experiments, socialist experiments, you will find complexity. You will find a complex narrative uh, and a complex history that does not necessarily yield a simple outcome, that we can just do that and then we go forward. So I think on that note, in terms of, of you know, I know you said this isn't what dialectics is about, but of the synthesis of taking what we know about the past of, and, and especially what we what we know about the conditions, the material structural conditions of climate change and so on that are pushing us into a new system. What do you think, Tony, that that new system could look like utilizing technology, you know, retaining these, you know, principles of worker ownership of, you know, oppressed being in control of the systems that can, that they are you know living under. So we know what's bad. We know what doesn't work. And there's a complex history of things that did and things that didn't. But I'm interested in what your synthesis of and what your ideas of that new system going forward. And um, then the you know the the religion that we will create around that, the story, the myth, the grandiose vision that will include all peoples building it. Well I'd say first and foremost we need to learn from our elders, you know, like the uh, people who tried were brave enough to try. That's ultimately why, um, like, despite being critical of, of previously actually existing socialism, I think we have to commend it for at least trying. Uh, and um, I think we should pay some sort of fidelity to those revolutionary events, which, uh, you know, frankly occurred miraculously a lot of the time, like, uh, like the Russian Revolution, uh, Chinese Revolution, uh, there's there's many experiences to learn from, but that's what they're there for—to learn from, not to like blindly take a kind of coping narrative that we can copy and paste. Um, a lot of, especially in the case of like the Cultural Revolution, I'll just wait till like my paper is out uh, one because there's paper being published, and also a video that's going to be like two videos that are going to be built off of that. Cultural revolution is a really interesting event uh, more because it actually like they were trying to really figure, ask questions Mao himself too. Um, and um, it begs more questions than it does answers. Let's just say that. I don't think people can look at the cultural revolution and think that there was like a model that could be synthesized off of that. I think it's not very clear. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll say this, look, Lenin before he died in his last published uh, writing, which was called better, fewer, but better. Uh, he said, 
the state apparatus that we have built is just barely better than the Zaris one. <laughs> and he 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 <laughs> said like it's this, our state apparatus is rotten and wretched. And like you know he was wow. like saying we need to. He saw the bureaucracy problem happening and how that has to. That's like an existential problem that needs to be dealt with. How social relations are still kind of like they still like not very much changed even though it's still like a dictatorship of the proletariat right um that's not to say it's not nothing but what i mean is lenin was very uncertain before his death you know who also was too is mao mao you know questioned the idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat entirely which is it's like a lot of not a lot of people know this like if they don't study the cultural revolution and its aftermath very much and he was like existentially very confused after the, the cultural revolution he wanted it to be debated. Now the capitalists wrote like who were frankly like capitalists, like uh, um, in a socialist clothing in, in China at the time, like Deng Xiaoping, uh, they prevent, they like when he took power, he prevented that uh, issue from being debated from like learning from the cultural revolution. Um, and, you know, there's a vested interest in people who want a capitalist system to prevent like debate on the system because like the cultural revolution Mao himself acknowledged was like, you know, a total failure. Uh, but it was, it's when he actually expected to be a total failure. It was almost like an experiment and like, it's up to us now because all these people are like dead. We need to actually like learn from these experiences. Um, I guess to bring that now to like the question about like, what does another society look like? I mean, I don't have the answers, but we can look at like one thing I think Marx really got right. One of the things Marx in many ways predicted with the limitations of actually existing socialism uh, before he obviously they were tried was uh, that you fundamentally need to pass through the stage of, of capitalism or have the development of capitalism, like the development of the productive forces um, and the material abundance necessary uh, before socialism or before well, the transition to communism is possible. In other words, you need wealth before you can distribute it. Uh, you need, uh, like capitalism, he saw it as like, you know, it's, it's a system that's fundamentally terrible for the environment. It's, uh, it, it's vastly exploitative. It's alienating all these different things. Um, but, you know, it's very productive more than other systems. And he, if anything, was too op- a little bit too optimistic about capitalism's like productivity and whatnot. Because I think, uh, the idea that capitalism is progressive, like it certainly was the case at one point. I don't think it's really the case anymore at all. Um, but uh, with um, with that in mind, I mean, the unfortunately, this the places where revolutions took place were places that were like the, the some of the poorest places in the world, and that had a were over determined by a variety of contradictions that like led to revolutions and. Um, but in, we're in places where the material conditions were functionally like very hard to deal with. Like, you know, China was extremely poor. USSR was extremely poor, both semi-feudal agrarian, uh, uh, countries. You know, you look at like an advanced industrial society, like the United States, Canada, Germany, um, Britain, so many like, even like countries, in, many countries in Latin America now are more advanced than like the, than, uh, China was at the time the communists took power. Right like in terms of like wealth and whatnot and access to technology. So you have one, like it's a lot easier to build a social system when you don't have uh, people, everyone living in like rural villages and uh, kind of like, you know, like a large peasantry who it's a little bit hard to have like an idea of like collectivism and, and like these sort of arrangements. Now there are like ways to deal with that and whatnot. And there's all sort of complexities, but what I mean, okay, the conditions are here that are, are way more, f- like, purely material conditions are way more favorable to, like, any sort of socialist communist project than in, they were before. So there's that. Now, um, with regard to, like, building a society that uh, learns from the past, there's there's a million things that I think are, are you, we can't brush off that were contradictions that plagued the previous systems that um, we need to learn from. One, I think, is the... Uh, contradiction between markets you know at the end of the day uh communism is supposed to be a stateless classless moneyless society but uh it's really really hard to get rid of something like commodity production overnight and uh markets because the fact is is as long as there's certain goods and services that people want um that aren't being provided by like a collective 
plan of some sort, like, you know, uh, planning, whether it be decentralized planning, state planning, however you like prefer to design it. But at the end of the day, if that's, if certain needs aren't being met by that, people will, will figure out how to profit from that. Uh, markets existed way before capitalism for a reason. It's just that like the cap, mar- the, 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 mer- the, the bourgeois class becomes the dominant class and you have a capitalist system with a state that reproduces their interests. It's a very different story than like little people like profiting on the side from whatever trade. Every country that tried to get rid of markets entirely completely failed to do so. Like whether it be, uh, you know, who, in the, the USSR, USSR, um, uh, the Eastern Bloc countries, although they then very quickly allowed markets because uh, to exist in the black, uh, the black markets, because they're actually meeting some people's demands better than the plan was for certain, like, you know, non-essential goods, at least. Uh, not, markets are good for non-essential goods. For essential goods, they're actually absolutely terrible. Um, they're very inefficient. Uh, the, the Marx calls the anarchy of the market for a reason. It's fucking like, you have... I don't even need, we, we know like, we just look at COVID. Okay. So why markets are very like inefficient in producing needs uh, and fulfilling certain vital needs. Uh, now, uh, to get rid of markets over time. I don't think you can. It's like sort of like the state. You can't just abolish the state. As long as there's class differences, there'll be something like a state, like uh, something that tries to establish a monopoly on violence through apparatuses um, to uphold a class conflict. So, you know, the state, state can only like be actively withered away as class conflict is, you know, uh, is lessened. Uh, in the same way, I think markets can only be withered away as there's a superior system that can meet the same needs, uh, that meet people's needs better than markets can. Um, the le- you, you get a fundamentally like a very lackluster society when you try to abolish markets and We've seen that in countless examples. That's why every even existing so-called socialist state, uh, you know, aside from China, obviously, is the notorious example. Vietnam too, but even the like Cuba, which many people still believe, believe is socialist, um, you know, in some capacity, like kind of is, but um, has uh, markets. Like it's, they have made many reforms, and they recognize North Korea as markets, contrary to popular belief. Like all every system realized that. Like the ab- t- attempt to like abolish markets entirely or completely like it's a ri- ridiculous failure. So we need to learn from that. Uh, you know, we have to recognize that there's going to be birthmarks of the old society. You can't just like prioritize ideology over practical fucking things that like meet people's needs. What is why would anyone support socialism, communism or any left ideology if it didn't make people's lives better? That's what we're trying to do. Make people's lives better. It's not just like an ideology to like fulfill, like the who's the fastest to go to communism. That can be good. It can also be if communism entails making people more poor, like, you know, for the majority of people, obviously the working, the ruling classes are going to get poor for good. Then that's good. But, uh, you know, we, we want something that like if it doesn't make people's lives better, what's if it's not about the good life, why even strive for it, right? So we need to prioritize these kind of practicalities almost. I guess the other big reason, and this is a very difficult one, is the question of like democracy and civil liberties. Uh, those things are actually kind of separate, even though they're connected. Uh, but like the USSR, people kind of know, and many existing socialist countries, I think were, were notoriously pretty undemocratic. And there's uh, many, you know, some people will say um, that you know, the system, clearly the solution wasn't just to revert to like liberal multi-party democracy, like which is what Gorbachev tried to do, that immediately like allowed the system to totally collapse. Uh, And why, what does it matter if you have multiple parties, if like, you know, they're like capitalist parties, we're just going to try to weasel their way back in and like reverse all the progress, you know? We want like a democracy that actually like, you know, to a certain extent empowers people. So like I think democracy in the workplace is like one place to start. Like where people actually spend life, I think people give a shit more about that than like going to community meetings and fucking voting for all of the policies of the state of the society. I think people ultimately would be care much more about democracy and everyday life. Like, you know, maybe we shouldn't like have arbitrary hierarchies, like something I'm against. Like I think hierarchies are if, if, if people actually voluntarily submit to them is a different thing. 
than something like, you know, you have a boss, I have more money than you. I can fire you. I, I decide what to do. The board of directors decides what the enterprise is, not the people who actually produce the value for it. Like, you know, stuff that like Richard Wolf promotes, uh, stuff that's, you no. Know, in line with Marxism, but it's not just worker co-ops. There's things like collectives, which did exist in Mao's China, uh, among many uh, actually interesting experiments. Um, and um, you know, there's all sort of different arrangements, endless how complexity did, how here. Did, what is a but, what is a collective in that in that sense? So a collective is is like loosely tied to the state, but it's autonomous and from it in the sense that it's not like state managers who it's not like nationalized, so to speak. But it's collective in the sense that the profit that a uh, collective makes is going to ultimately be somehow redistributed to the broader society. So it is like, I guess, tied to the state, but it's not like it's autonomous from the state in the sense that it's not like a nationalized enterprise where the state can arbitrarily um, like, you know, uh, fire people or like, um, I don't, it's, it's complicated, but a collective is essentially a way of giving people power, but without having the plague that sometimes happen. The problem that happens with worker co-ops is worker co-ops can very easily lead to like just capitalism. Um, and that is a, a thing, unfortunately, like uh, Mondragon is a perfect example. Like, I mean, they're participating in a global capitalist system. So like sh that shouldn't be too surprising, but I mean, if a worker co-op is still ultimately going to be an enterprise that strives for profit, it's just that the profit is redistributed among like, that like cooperative it's more egalitarian in that sense but it's still like going to be they're going to be it's still like a certain competitive spirit between other co uh, cooperatives cooperatives could get bigger to the point where they just like buy up other cooperatives and reproduce capitalism in a certain sense like so we need to like you know co i'm not against cooperatives by the way i think they're great for like a transitionary period um and they're very practical and they exist and like that's why richard wolf is such a big fan of them but I mean, it's not like the only well, to, mode of to, organization, to up, right? To pick up right there, um, I, and I think both of those ideas of the cooperative and the collective, I think are really where my mind is at. I think if we had had this conversation three or four months ago, five months ago, however, when we first started talking about doing a collab, I would have been much more focused on the big picture that that late, <laughs> late stage post-capitalism, you know, this, you know, uh, regenerative automated ai assisted bioeconomy you know that we've done multiple shows about you know many many shows we've discussed about but what i'm really interested in developing at this time this moment is an intercooperative transition a transition that is more like a syndicalism or collectivism or uh, groups of cooperatives that are within themselves worker owned operations and we're working on a whole new model that is actually viable in this existing system where basically by um, circumventing the need to pay people a wage and having everyone be a part owner of their enterprise and diverting resources to providing people with the things that they need, housing, food, shelter, you know, healthcare to the best of your abilities, the things we need, you know, and then giving people uh, essentially a universal basic income and, and, just so they can go to town and buy an ice cream cone. Say you're in a you're in a community, you know, set, sort of setting where you're in a design community that's using natural building, that's using that's you know connected to nature, that's providing the majority of its food through permaculture and other natural living systems, um, designing an environment and a habitat that is you know requires less input, less resources, is cheaper to build, is is more sustainable, and is more pleasing to be in. That we have a, a stake in designing. So giving people life, you know, allowing people to live and we, you can operate things in a, a leaderless or a decentralized horizontal structure like sociocracy, which is what we use in our organization where we're tooling out and figuring out and, um, you know, not having to pay people wages, but allow, having a collective funding pool where if you need more money than, you know, the UBI or, or, or the, uh, you know, the basic access to services that you're able to produce that others cooperatives in your network are able to produce, then, you know, you can say, Hey, I need to, I need money to go see my, my grandparents, they're dying. You know, you, you pull money from the pool and this could be done in a DAO. This could be done in, you know, as simply as you want it or as complicated as you want it. It could be a fully auto AI auto assisted wealth redistribution algorithm. Like, uh, Google's DeepMind did an experiment about value alignment and, uh, uh wealth redistribution AIs. And they had an experiment with, 
a group of people that decided what, where the fake money, the resources that they were talking about would go, and they had an AI to do it. And the AI produced an outcome that every single person was more happy about. So essentially, that's the idea is, you know, we, we create this system that is more efficient in all these areas and using all these new technologies, all these productive forces like mild automation or you know, sufficient automation, sufficient use of technology, sufficient use of AI, you know, the, the viability of communes goes up drastically when you just add something like solar and wind energy to them, or, you know, advancements in natural building like earth ships that make them just a lot nicer and a lot, you know, uh, more viable in the long term. that you can have, you know, internet, like in a lot of communities I've been to out here, it's a farm in the middle of nowhere in Colombia and they have satellite internet. I mean, you can live a really fucking nice life in a nearly post scarcity environment where it's not like you have, you know, there is a limit to what you can have, but food, you know, fruit drops from the trees that, that you can't have it all. You know, you can have avocado trees all around you that you, you can't eat all the avocados you produce, et cetera. You can be in community with other people. And that's ultimately what you want. That's the payment for life is to live to be with the people you love, to have free time, to enjoy yourself. I mean, I, I think that's the measure of, of wealth and success in society. And the peoples that I'm here to visit, to film with and learn from, the Arwakos, are an indigenous group that lives in an actually existing, I would say, post-scarcity environment. They, they, they have scarcity and they don't have all of what they need and they have you know, a lot of limitations in a lot of areas, but they don't have a value system that's based in scarcity. They don't have a money game or a market and people in their society get what they need and this sustains them. They don't, they don't need other incentives. So that's, yeah, sorry to go off on a long tangent, but this is really what we're trying to advance and develop and make our organization about bringing about this transition to go beyond the cooperative. The principle of the cooperative is good, like you were just saying, but then where's the, the second step to that where they're connected to others in a network? And it's really, we want to go beyond markets to networks. So we have this network economy where instead of we're trading and exchanging between each other to gain and maximize more profit, you develop a, a way to sustainably make enough money you know, to exist in a steady state and in a way where you're able to grow and improve life and, and circulate resources to others in your community, in your network, in your cooperative, your inter-cooperative sort of uh, network. But uh, yeah, I mean... There is a possibility for a transitional system that sets in motion a change to the social relationships, a change to the material relations of production that will change the people within them to be more uh, egalitarian, less capitalistic, uh, to functionally eliminate the need for oppressive hierarchies and just basically give everyone autonomy within their domain to do what they do well. So when people are good at something, they're allowed to do it. And but there, but that that isn't a hackable you know, position that can then become self-justifying and become oppressive and lead to many of the problems that we see in actually existing socialist systems that did not listen to the anarchists of their time or even the mainstream Marxists of their time that were saying, don't set your society up in this way. Don't have such a fragile, tiered, hierarchical, authoritarian structure. You're going to reproduce the, the same, you know, systems of domination that we produced. So that's, yeah, sorry, that, that was a long tangent. I don't know how to put that as a question, but maybe you can bounce off I, from I, there. I definitely uh, have something to bounce off there because uh, you're uh, totally right in the sense that uh, th we need to build structures um, that are post-capitalist outside of the state because the thing is, is progress, po political progress within the state is just as easily reversible by the state. So like, you know, the thing is, if you have something tied to the state, like, like unions, uh, you can very like let's say if you have um, your projects are, yeah are tied to the state. If you have a simple regime change or even a change in the party leadership, a lot, of, a lot of the progress can simply just be thrown out the window like overnight. I mean, you saw that uh, in countless examples. But I mean, um, one interesting example is uh, Salvador Allende. Is like a lot of the project was you know even though it was more democratic, it was tied to the state. So like you had a all it took is a military coup. Um, to completely undo all the progress, there wasn't really a base of socialism outside of the state for people to actually like hold on to. Um, it, it was very easily dismantled, and that happened in many, many, many examples. I mean, Soviet Union itself, Sankara, for example, Soviet Union, uh, you know, abolishing the Soviets and uh, kind of having unions tied to the state and everything tied to the state. Is very <laughs> the Soviet Union abolished the Soviets. That's insane. 
That's totally I mean, crazy though, like, that anyone could hold that up as a perfect model. So, I mean, uh, Soviets are a difficult. workers' council it's for difficult. anyone who doesn't understand that, and that's the that's the way yeah. that they built up the dual power needed well, to take it over. Is, it's it's very it's very nuanced though. The issue with with that is because, I mean, there's like, this is the thing why one needs to like look at the history because the conditions they dealt with were pretty like insane. I mean, you had like a civil war and you had a system where they actually tried to give factories to the workers and workers continually were selling their factories. Like there's a lot of people and there was one, the workforce wasn't the majority. The majority of people were peasants and the majority of the workforce that did exist were illiterate. Like it had really unbearable conditions. Like, I mean, you know, this is the thing that we have to remember that the Bolsheviks were the only people who even thought of having the Soviets in the first place. Like the Mensheviks were like, you know, they, they were way more gradualists. The SRs were basically just like liberal capitalists. And then you had um, Rosa Luxemburg even who did who didn't who argued against uh, Lenin abolishing the Constituent Assembly and having instead uh, like a Soviet democracy. Instead, she preferred like we should keep the Constituent Assembly, which was like more or less parliamentary. Uh, at the time, she thought that. So, like, just keeping in mind that, like, you know, the Bolsheviks were the radicals at the time. It's not like a right wing deviation. And they, like, you know, gave up on that project very fast, as we saw with the abolishing the Soviets. But we need to see that, like, these things aren't very difficult. But uh, I would say, yeah, no, to the tie that before, it's very absolutely crucial to have structures outside of the state to not have dependence. But this is where the rational kernel, kernel of Marxism Leninism comes in. This is why I think we still have a lot to learn from the likes of people like Lenin and the likes of, you know, socialism that actually like existed more than a couple of months uh, is that the, the thing is, is the counter reaction among uh, the ruling classes, the reactionary classes is going to be absolutely brutal. They're going to mobilize on a global scale uh, to squash whatever project remotely threatens the dominant mode of production. So how do you defend against that? The issue is like, you know, I think decentralized movements are kind of, they can be really good at like resisting capitalism in a certain sense because they're hard to chop off. One, because they're not tied to the state also because they don't have, they're not all tied to like a specific leadership. You can't just decapitate it, which happens with a lot of centralized organizations like the Black Panther Party, which was quite successful. But when you, they decapitated its leadership, the, the movement was, the party was dead, you know? So the, that's the, 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 there's like a contradiction to wrestle with here, but you know, the problem with having like completely decentralized movements and not without a centralized uh, structure like a state to kind of help fight against the counter revolutionary forces of the global capitalist class. Because remember, they're global. They unify, unlike the left. <laughs> the capitalists always tend to unify way more uh, and uh, to squash whatever like revolutions. This is not just a new thing. It's not just the Russian Revolution. It was happening before the Russian Revolution. The, in fact, actually, the czar, the the one who was two czars before Nicholas, I forget his name, uh, Alexander, uh, was famous for actually qu crushing revolutions globally, by for like as like the the all, like the staunch counter revolutionary. And I'm sure this. I think you know if you had a revolution in India today, I think China might even try to crush it. Who knows? I hope not, but I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, they're already. It would backing. disrupt their business. It would disrupt yeah. their business model. It would keep. It right. would, you know, it would, and their logic would be perfectly rational by their standards. They would say, "Well, we need to accumulate productive forces. We need to keep making money so that we can turn it into, you know, the betterment of our people, and so we can build socialism." There's a there's a capitalist description, you know, a way to justify it, it's and rational. then there's a socialist way to justify it. That you know, and that's one of the big problems that we're experiencing is uh, a lack of an atomization at all points that there's this systematic breakdown. Yeah. Like, so this yeah, is, I think this is why my, the point with that though, is that this, you still need like a state. Um, it just needs to be like let more, dem, like more liberal in the sense that it's not overbearingly totalitarian on its population, like how certain systems were. I think there's systems that have already made great progress on this. Like Cuba is, is far less totalitarian. It's not, it's, I wouldn't, it's not a totalitarian society. First of all, Cuba, like, you know, you could call it authoritarian, but no, not really any more than like other capitalist countries are. Um, and, you know, it's like, that's a system I think is very still like bureaucratic, very problematic, but you look at its conditions, it's hard to go and tell like, let's say Cuban socialists that, oh, things would be better if you just had like, instead of one communist party in a state, 
you just had like a bro a bunch of little federations like let's say um syndicates like uh syndicates like uh you had or a bunch of different autonomous organizations from the state in different little local areas that uh, were more directly democratic. The issue with that, okay, is they're right next to the United States. And how easy would it be for the United States to simply pay off the different factions who are armed? So there's no monopoly on violence, a state. There's, it's, there's, with a, if you have a stateless system, there's the violence, is, the uh, tools for violence are spread among different like little militias, different like uh, groups. So how easy would it be for the U.S. to just pay some of the groups gazillions of dollars to go massacre each other? I mean, it's, the, it's easy to say I'm an anarchist, I'm a Mar- Marxist, communist, whatever. The United States pays you $2 million to go kill the other faction. A lot of people would quake under that pressure. They would absolutely go against all their values. And that's the thing why like, you kind of need some structures. Um, you need like, you need, a, a one structures in, within the organization, but also, I mean, you just need a state to help like keep things together. Like is like, it's really until revolution is like a global thing, you're going to have states because you're going to have the globalist capital, the global capitalist class mobilized together through forces to absolutely destroy whatever movement exists. The fact of the matter is, is like, even like you could say broadly successful, uh, like, you know, I would say libertarian socialists because, you know, the Zapatistas aren't anarchists, but they're like libertarian socialists or, um, you know, the people in Rajava, too. Um, those experiments exist as long as like the states will allow them to. Like, for example, if the United States wants to allow Rojava to be absolutely demolished by the Turkish military, they can. not Or if the Mexican military, with the help of the U.S., wants to destroy Chiapas, they can not so that's the issue we need to like be very sober about is like, you know, these are great progress. Like these movements are progress because they show that there's alternative ways to live and they can give people hope. But those in themselves, I mean, you, you need like a lot more and you need a lot. You're going to need like actual organized powers to resist the capitalist powers. It's going to be like a domino. You're, you're going to have it's for some capitalist powers will go down way slower than each other than others. And some will absolutely mobilize every force they can to crush the opposition. So that means compromises with like material conditions. And that's why, you know, this idea of like, this is why I'm not an anarchist at the end of the day, because like, practically speaking, it's just um, like, I don't think it's going to be really viable as like a mass politics, but I, I kind of do. Uh, I'm not really like, I don't consider anarchists enemies because at the end of the day, they're trying to build like a capitalist society. They tend to be also open-minded in their approach uh, more than like, you know, more the authoritarian types. Um, and they're showing like, you know, as you said, doing with dealing with uh, tools that we have right now. So I think building structures outside of the state are essential, but we can't, let's say, act like, like let's say like the Cuban Communist Party or whatever movement we see in the future, like, if they do things that are seem authoritarian, we can't out act like they're uh, completely irrational for doing something that doesn't adhere to like utopian objectives. Because revolution is ugly, class struggle is ugly, and we have to just accept like there's going to be um, authoritarian practices that are going to happen. You know, even in the anarchist organizations. By the way. Catalonia, for example, the anarchists burned down churches. They, uh, you know, looted businesses. They did all sort of like, you know, things that could be perceived as authoritarian. But like, you know, it's that's what happens in a revolution. Like, it's just, that's how it goes. How do we prevent a, a room? The bigger question is, how do we prevent a socialist communist project from cannibalizing itself and actually oppressing the very people it seeks to emancipate? So when it starts actually oppressing its own people, that's when it's pro- like a problem, and that those are the criti- critiques, critics, I, uh, critiques I would have of existing systems. Well, so, yeah, I think I have, a, you know, not a complete answer, but I think there are certainly answers to this, and I think you you said it very correctly that we need an organizational structure. We need a structure that is centralized, and not centralized in terms of its, you know, power exceeds down from this point and then trickles out. But I think in creating a technological system and a social organizational system, a network, 
that is able to connect these people to each other so that they are not going to turn on their neighbors because they depend on their neighbors, that they are interdependent with each other and that they are interconnected, that they are uh, connected and collaborative beyond the confines of their individual community, their individual town, but they're actually working actively with the peoples in the other regions around them. And I think that uh, Rojava is really one of the most interesting and powerful places, a place I really want to visit. I really want to f- go there and film their system because uh, as G- David Graeber was talking about it, they have a kind of something that you could compare to a state where they have like this bottom up system. And then they have a system that's kind of a top up, top, top down system, but it's like the top the system at the top answers to the people at the bottom and you can fire the people at the top, whereas the people at the top cannot fire the people. And so I think that we do need some kind of system that is organized, that is orchestrated there. But I think it's, when I think about this, I think about circles and circles in circles and this kind of fractal pattern of things, you know, starting out in their most integral form, which is a community, which is a group of people working together to meet their needs they know each other. They care about each other. They're not going to sell them. They're not going to sell each other out. They're not going to try to connive and take over and get more power because you know if you're in a democratic institution, you cannot. You can you can say let's vote to make me you know ten times richer than everyone else. Who the fuck is going to go along with that? Well, you have to. It's very easy you know, to do. It's actually very easy to do. People. That's what we need to. We have to acknowledge that like the masses are both smart and stupid. Well, so if you have humans are very sophisticated, but we're also very like vulnerable to stuff like charisma, for example, charisma. I think think there's it's actually quite interesting. Like there's actually some uh, there's a study of this by a um, a guy's name is last name is Wamba de Wamba. But uh, he um, he's like a Marxist. He studied um, indigenous groups in uh, Congo and like how there's a. like there's actually often a, a suspicion of what they called sorcery, meaning that like sorcery was actually the precursor to like author like authority structures, like kind of the the establishment of the state. Um, so like you know, we have to understand that like direct democracy very easily leads to like a kind of tyranny of its own, uh, and this is not a, like a new insight. Um, this is something that's like an insight of obviously like the many of the ancient Greeks themselves when analyzing Athenian democracy. Uh, and uh, I mean, there, there's, there's a tendency where like a sort of structuralist system can easily, people will uh, channel their desires for a sort of master because I, that is a thing we can't escape from. There is like a tendency among people, uh, among not everyone, but at least a portion of people to kind of seek these like authority structures of some kind. And will place hope, uh, help, uh, and uh, hope in a sort of like despot who might kind of undo all the progress. Um, and there's some, you know, groups that were actually keenly aware of this intrinsic thing in human nature and fought against it. Uh, you know, I say human nature like not as if it's like a totalizing thing in all of the species, but there is a tendency, right, of, of like structures and authority. Uh, authority. Now, where I'm going with that, I guess, is, you know, you, I don't, I, I'm not, I'm very hesitant to give my whole take on authority uh, and centralization, just because I could easily get clipped in a um, in a way that kind of takes what I say out of context, because it's a hard position to defend. It's controversial, but let's just say this. You know, a lot of leftists get hit with the smearing argument that socialism, communism, whatever, egalitarianism doesn't work because of human nature. And we respond by saying, well, there's no real like stable human nature. Like humans have clearly changed over time. We're subject to our structures we build for ourselves. There's all sort of different like groups, different indigenous groups, for example, like don't all act the same. They have different structures. Like there's no reducible just signal human nature, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't like not deal with the question of human uh, condition behavior. Yeah. Human behavior, like human behavior. There are tendencies we can certainly learn from that are observable in all sort of experiments that we need to account for. And one is the fact that like a lot of the times like authority structures, people seek them out and sometimes they're like actually very useful. Um, it's just that, like, how do you prevent, like, a hierarchy from being arbitrary? 
meaning that it's entirely self-justifying, meaning that even if people don't actually like adhere to it, it can still like force itself. And, um, you know, we need, these are questions that are, I think probably beyond the scope of this podcast, but, uh, I would, uh, I would just say that, you know, we're, this is a theme of like avoiding one dimensionality. We don't want to think too much to like exclusively prioritizing, Oh, the state, the party, the centralized party line, um, thinking socialism is just nationalization or, uh, um, you know, uh, stuff that actually existing socialist movements, uh, actually existing socialist states did. You can't like only privilege that and at the same time oppose that only with like avoiding escaping power, which I think just leads to pseudo politics sometimes, like where people want to escape those political questions of power entirely and uh, regress into all sort of experiments. So I think, you know, you need to kind of like encounter both. There's a place for both. Um, we need to grapple with the contradictions of both. The answers are not very easy, but like, look, I'll refer people to that book. I recommended it originally, how, how to be anti-capitalist in the 21st century. It actually, it, uh, it deals with this question directly uh, in a, like the centralized decentralized question. Um, yeah. So on that, on that note of, uh, like dealing with contradictions and the imperfectness of what we're dealing about, um, we could have an entire show about that centralization versus decentralization issue. I think we should actually, uh, we'll definitely have another show after this one soon. Uh, I think we're kind of coming to the end of our time today. Um, I would like to briefly answer that though. And that, that, uh, I don't have the time to go into the technical explanation of how all of this would function and how we would go through all of these issues. But I, I I have answers for all of them, or at least good um, starting points to say we can answer these issues. We can work these bugs out because we know these structures are oppressive. And I think that ultimately in creating a system that is from the, from the smallest unit resilient, that is both dependent on and continually feeding back to others in its network. It's this, it's really taking ourselves out of this attitude of states or of markets and going and understanding the, the logic of the network, which is the, this, the symbol of our time, this mycelial network, this, this, you know, um, lattice of crystalline structures that each connect to each other and form larger structures and make up each other, that they're all dependent upon each other. And so, you know, even just in the, the microcosm of the workplace using a sociocratic or holocratic structure, you can have a system where you don't have a, a boss, you know? And I think if you use uh, sophisticated coordination, like the Arwakos that I'm staying with now, they have a, they have internal and external coordinators, just like sociocracy, where they have people that go between the representatives, the mamos, the, the wise men are like the internal coordinators of each village. And they deal with spiritual and ecological matters and just kind of a, uh, um, they have a kind of spiritual wisdom that is an authority, but it is highly earned. And it's something that's interesting. I mean, it's lasted thousands of years. It has never devolved into anything like a state. But they ah, have, you but said something very interesting there. Authority what? that is earned. Well, it's very rare. I mean, it's it's like they spend what? their entire life studying like deep with the deep wisdom of ecology and like living in darkness for periods of time. And they are basically like egoless and that they are like translators for nature that they're translating for the ecology ultimately their ecosystem is the boss and they follow natural law they don't have a word for freedom they they don't believe in free will because ultimately natural law is what dictates what they do and if we have a natural law economy as peter joseph's term you know um we and we follow the dictates of ecology and that's our central system is the needs of our literal environment that we live that we live in that we depend on, and the environment that we construct outside of that that is comprised of us and other net nodes in the network like us that we are all dependent upon that all scale to this point where we're able to fluidly interact between them where there's resilience communication, uh, the ability for them to adapt to changes to threats to you know um, things that could alter the flow and the structure, but that also just makes them more efficient. It makes them able to, to share ideas, innovations, I, you know, material resources, and in this current system, resources like money that they can help build each other up so that they're, they're spreading in a very different way from capitalism, 
They're not spreading in this vertical way. They're spreading in a horizontal way where they're working to mutually assure the survival and the betterment and the well-being of all in the network. And so you can have this society that is like, as my friends at the Oravana Project, some of the most brilliant people I know, talk about it as a community type society, as community at scale. And the technology we have today, without even getting into the whole new frontier of AI that we're just now beginning to explore, we can have systems where we are held accountable based on ecosystem pressures, based on you know bioavailability of resources, based on the actual feedback of how the people in your society and in your system are doing. We can have really complex but sophisticated and streamlined measures of how people are doing that allow us to know how certain people in certain positions of responsibility are faring. But we also have a system that is learning from you know groups like the Zapatistas and uh, you know Rajava, which is unfortunately there's not more systems and experiments like that. But they're optimistic and they show us that we can figure this out. We can figure this problem out without devolving to an authoritarian mode of development or uh, governance that we know through so many experiments throughout history, through all human history, through every fucking Shakespeare play and Greek tragedy. How many of them are about authority gone wrong? So I, I think I'd like to end with on that sort of basis because my computer is about to die here and we're in this fucking I'm in this weird environment. This house has like no power. I don't know how I still have Wi-Fi. <laughs> All the working guys came in and they were doing it in the background. They couldn't fucking figure it out. Thanks neoliberal imperialism. But yeah, these are these are the the question I've been saying to people or the, the response to a lot of like hard stops people put up in their environment and their development their imagination and development is, is that the limit of your imagination? And I want to leave the viewer on that, that, you know, these are problems. These are questions and opportunities for us to figure out how do we create a new structure and a new system that retains the, the elements that are needed to keep it living longer than three weeks and create something that's resilient, something that creates a feedback loop that grows larger than it, something that is emergent and ever evolving and deepening, something that changes our relationships with each other and continually reinforces the values that we know are necessary to survive in the long term. I would say I, dis I disagree with some of the stuff, uh, the anti-authoritarian stuff you mentioned, because uh, I just don't like the term, like even authoritarian as like a category really, but like the word totalitarian, I actually prefer, ironically, even though people hate that one, just because I think um, there, <laughs> there, there are like, I, I, I think that's something we can very much avoid. <laughs> but uh, I will, I will just say that you are absolutely onto something in the sense that we need to be uh, open-minded and and, and uh, have imagination in creating systems that like aren't merely replicas of the past. I very much subscribe to uh, the um, Herbert Marcuse's kind of sort of vision outlined at the end of One Dimensional Man, uh, a book that definitely inspired me quite a bit. That I you know have some criticisms of too, but like I very much like adhere to his sort of like thinking that's still very Marxist, but in a Marxist that's like non dogmatic very imaginative and very uh let's say uh for a for cheesy term visionary we shouldn't we shouldn't uh we shouldn't be afraid of words like that you know i, I would rather live in a visionary society than a totalitarian society <laughs> unless it's a, tot uh, a totalizing uh environment of imagination where all people are empowered to have autonomy to freely re-envision the society that they're in like jacques fresco said i love this quote he was like um the uh the cities that I design will be straight jackets to the children of, of the future. And the utopia is a dangerous idea. Utopia means no place. I, I would, I would say I'm a utopian. I mean, I want to, to strive for something we never get to something that's always better, something that's not just reactionary and based on anti-capitalism. I'm against this thing, but I want to base my constructions and my life and my element, uh, my, um, adventure through this existence and my every, uh, effort, my every breath based on what the world is that I would like to live in and base that on it and then work backward. And that's, we're in an interesting space where we have a lot of options. We have a lot of potential and power to create a new kind of movement and actually build something that is actually built. That isn't just navel gazing and, and hypothesizing that we can start to redirect our energy and our we labor. We do need to hypothesize. Well, we do. Not, yeah. about, not just that. I, I mean, we're I'm all about the hypothesis. Oh, I wanted to say earlier that in uh, with fairness to the experiments of the past, the Soviet Union, you know, the the Maoist China, like it, 
there's never, there's always scenes in movies with scientists where they're like, my experiment failed. When scientists never do that. There's no failing an experiment. There's just learning like, okay, that didn't work. Um, what did work though? You know, what, what was, what was the phenomenon that, that, I, you know, mm -hmm. that I understood there? What was the data that we gathered from there that is going to help us to readjust and move forward? That's ultimately what we're here. Tony, uh, love talking to you all the time. Um, my computer's about to die and I think we've, we've had ourselves a, a heady, hearty chat that will set us up to keep going in further shows. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I'll always appreciate it. Do you have any other closing thoughts before my computer explodes and, and we are jettisoned hitherto into the new world, the world of dreams? <laughs> I would just say, uh, I think you'd really <laughs> like Herbert Marcuse from everything you're saying. Uh, maybe one dimensional man is a big one to start with, but I would say like read his essay, uh, end of utopia. Uh, I think it was a lecture actually, but like it's in, you know, like you can, it's written format. Definitely check out End of Utopia. You'll, it speaks your language. Like, like uh, I, I like Marcuse. You know, I'm critical of I think his psychoanalysis is absolute garbage, but that's another story. But like his, his, his politics, I like. Well, I like you, Tony. I like hanging out with you. I like talking about this stuff. I, you have Likewise. a tremendous knowledge and uh, it's just always fun. Um, it, it, you know more than uh, than than Chat GPT in in a lot of areas I hope of so. like I can't I, I can't I get reliable so. information on like what's the because I, I go through this a lot like was was the Soviet Union like I read these tanky takes and I'll be like was the Soviet Union really good like like people like uh what's his name Paul Co not Paul Cockshot he's the he's actually pretty good guy he's, he's cool. actually no, I'm decent. thinking about um. Who's the guy that uh, Grover Fur? That's like Stalin never did anything wrong. Yeah, I couldn't yeah. find any claim, and I always like I I'm a skeptic, so I try to be like, okay, is that true? I can't just dismiss it. But talking to people like you who have actually done the reading, talking to people like my friend Jeff Cates who have actually done the reading, I'm I'm not that fastidious a reader, honestly. Like I absorb information from a lot of different sources. Do you like audio books? Talks. I just don't have the. My life is too chaotic for. To, to consistently absorb media. Like I've been listening to debt the first 5,000 years on YouTube as an audio book. For yeah. Like six I listened months. to the same one like two years ago, the same, like one on YouTube probably. I, I learn through like two, two, two things like through cryptic symbolism in my dreams and uh, the, you know, in, in, in like implacable psychedelic, like spiritual reverberation that like drives me through the world toward this inexorable, like beautiful blinding white flash of truth that I find in like synchronicities that, you know, kind of build the stones in the journey that lead me to the next place. And, uh, you know, I just seek wizards and wise people. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I just, I love, uh, talks like this. I love this show because it's an ability for us to engage in these deep conversations that get us somewhere that we get further than we were when we started. But yeah, on that note, um, my, my computer is about to die. Um, let's uh, let's do another one soon, and uh, you choose the topic. Yeah, this uh, yeah, it was a great conversation. It just quite unstructured, but that's what we were going for. Kind of like a like a informal little like kind of to see where it goes. To see probably the next one we do will be uh, like more centered on some of the topics we were touching on, like on like one of one or two of them probably. Uh, cause they're such big topics, you know, like they entail, they really deserve like a focus in a certain sense, but, um, this was fun. I mean, well, this is kind of what I expected, uh, for like our first like <laughs> recorded one. Yeah. 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 Balls in your court. Choose, choose, uh, the, the territory next time and I'll, uh, I'll meet you there. Hey folks, Marlo here coming in from the future, not the future of the left that we talk about on this show, just the future from after this episode was recorded. This episode is being assembled by our crack team, and as always, this is all a labor of love. It takes a lot of people to do this. It takes a lot of effort and energy to run our ideological warfare meme pages, and to keep the show going, and to run our organization, our volunteer group that's feeding people, that's connecting people with people, that's making, doing our part to make the world better one little bit at a time as we prepare and develop larger transitions to get us out of this fucking mess. So support us, follow us, like, share, subscribe, subscribe to the Patreon. We're going to be rolling out early releases of episodes and all kinds of other goodies for the folks that support us. Remember, the light bulb was invented by candlelight. We critique these systems because we don't have an alternative yet. So let's get out there and build them. But <laughs> come on, 
We live in the present right now. There is no movement. There is no left. There is no revolutionary consensus of us coming together and helping each other. And we need to get on that. We need to fix that. We need to do something about that. That's what Moneyless Society and organization is trying to do. So get involved. Reach out. Join our Discord server. And let's, let's stop talking so much and start doing. <laughs> Love every one of you. Take it easy. Over and out.